Do you battle anxiety? Not sure if you can or even how to begin to overcome it? My guest today knows only too well about anxiety and she'll be sharing her story and tips that you can place into your journey. She's an amazing lady, businesswoman, artist and former youth worker, the wonderful Naomi Evans. And welcome dear friends to this episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life, from actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast where we inspire you, motivate you and educate you on the craziness of finding balance and the craziness of day-to-day -day life. I am as always your host John Morris and today I am really, really excited as always to do this show for you guys because today we're going to be exploring about the mind, about the body and also about the soul. We're looking at all three elements today because my guest has literally explored and experienced all three elements in a very, very different way. And we're going to be talking about artistry and anxiety as well. She is the owner of the brand new business, Rudj and Gannett, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. She is an amazing former youth worker, which we both got in common, and she's the wife of a minister and so much more. A very, very talented artist. And it's my pleasure to get to be, I believe, the first person to actually interview her for a podcast like this. Please welcome to the show, the wonderful and lovely, always exciting, Naomi Evans. Naomi, welcome to the show, my dear. How are you doing today? Thank you very much. I am well, thank you. Good. <laughs> yeah. Folks, we're probably going to spend most of the day laughing. So if you if you need a good laugh and a good pick me up, yeah, because it's friends, it's more relaxed and it's really chilled out. Uh, but Naomi, for the audience that maybe have never encountered you before, know very little about you, share with us a little bit about yourself and, and what it is that you do. Okay, but this is always the worst question to be asked, like share about yourself. Um... You've got so many good things, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I'm Naomi, as has been said. Um, I am first and foremost a Christian, um, which is helpful being married, as you said. <laughs> yes. He's actually a vicar in training. Um, he's not a fully, a fully fledged vicar yet. He's a um, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm originally from Macclesfield in Cheshire. Um, but I'm currently living in the West Midlands in the Black Country. Um, so people from here think I sound very posh, apparently. <laughs> um, I can understand yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, as you've said, I run a new business, Ridge and Garnet. Um, Garnet with a double T at the end. It is indeed, um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been doing that for two, nearly two months. I think it'll be two months on Saturday. Um, which is exciting, going well, learning an awful lot of new stuff. Um, but yeah, my my past working life has been with children and youth ministry in churches for about eight years. Wow. So talk to us a little bit about your early life, what it was growing up. Because The, the reason we ask this is because a lot of the issues that people face in their older life obviously stem from younger ages and things like that. And to get a picture, it's, it's always helpful to obviously be able to build it up. Talk to us a little bit about your early life and what it was like growing up um, you know, in, in the family that you've got. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know my family. Though. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I... Um, grew up in the most amazing family, um, mom and dad and two sisters, um, I am the middle one, uh, which we have a good laugh about, <laughs> me being the middle child, um, maybe a bit of middle child syndrome there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but like, my, my childhood is just filled with very fond memories, um, lots of funny stories as well. Um, 
and yeah it was just a very uh, loving Christian home um, and like I, I don't really know if there's much to say about childhood years or growing up um, other than I mean we'll get onto anxiety a little bit later um, but I was a worrier as a child mm -hmm. like I was always worrying um, so that was kind of always there but not full-blown anxiety at that point um but other than that like it was a generally very good and happy childhood well, that's, that's fantastic i want to ask you as well from a faith point of view what difference did it make and what i should rephrase that question what impact did having uh, parents who were believers have mm -hmm. on you um to be honest at the time i don't think i realized just the impact it had on okay. me um but it's looking back and especially like because I've worked with children in the church and with youth in the church, you then realize like those key figures in your life yeah. that have influenced your faith and your journey. And then you really appreciate actually like, wow, like the input that I got from my parents, yeah. my youth leaders and um, my church as well. Like when you look back on it, you're like, gosh like how valuable was that um so yeah like growing up with Christian parents it was just like God was part of life yeah. um it was never really a separate topic it was just like you know he was it's, ingrained in yeah. everything yeah it, um, it just is yeah and like just going to church was just mm -hmm. a thing we did and I don't think I thought anything like oh well, the families don't do this I just yeah. kind of grew up being like this is just what happens and you know it was it was a wonderful experience that actually I spent most of my childhood coloring in church <laughs> before I went out to the Sunday school like we'd be packed up with this little bag of uh, crayons and paper and so I'd just be in the service just drawing away. But, but um, it's amazing how common that is that parents yeah. will actually pack up you know th these giant bags you know of, mm -hmm. of coloring books and sweets and toys and everything that's there just for their kids to be in in the church yeah. service yeah. yeah. So yeah I was quite happy fashion designing while the, <laughs> the star songs were going on and stuff but um, yeah. It's an amazing thing, you know, what, what you described there, because that, that leads us well into our, our next point, I suppose, of when you became excited about art. And obviously, it sounds mm -hmm. like it started at a really early age for you. Yeah. Yes, like, art has always been a massive thing in my life. But like, the earliest, uh, the earliest thing I remember, actually, was re being really excited at a... Um, like preschool age, <laughs> I'd made this, um, what would you call it? Like a video recorder, okay. a big yep. video camcorder out of junk modeling with like a okay. cellophane thing on the end. So when you look through it, like the world is red. Um, I was like, I was so chuffed with this bit of junk modeling. It was like the most amazing thing I've ever created. Um, so I don't know, I was probably about three at that age. It's a three year old, that's a really amazing thing to have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like yeah from early as I can remember basically I have absolutely loved just creating and doing anything arty as I say church was just filled with doing art stuff um I used to <laughs> during primary school I used to win art competitions um even when I didn't want to <laughs> so, uh, can I tell you this story of course go for it um so <laughs> There was an art competition at primary school um, that was, I think it was for like healthy eating or healthy living. It was to encourage you to have healthy lives anyway. And um, you had to draw this picture to, <laughs> to kind of um, help get that message across. Okay. And I drew this picture of a toothbrush and toothpaste. So maybe I was focusing on the healthy teeth option. Um, but the prize was this massive hamper. Of, oh, wow fruit and veg and I remember mom saying to me don't win this one <laughs> we're going on holiday the next day we don't want a massive hamper of fruit and veg to take with us so like just don't win this one so I was like okay like I won't, I won't win this one I won't put in as much effort um and then I remember sat in the assembly and they announced the winner and it was like Naomi oh no <laughs> 
trying to smile like yay but inside i was like oh no i was told not to win oh, this oh boy um i remember like going out to mum in the playground being like i won <laughs> sorry <laughs> um he was fine about it I, like, I think we had a good laugh um, and had a load of fruit and veg to take on holiday but... absolutely uh you know and, and i can imagine your mum being like that you know <laughs> yeah. But the, the amazing thing is, you know, you and your mom uh, in particular, because obviously I'm, I'm very close with both of you and you both have that creative mind that's there mm -hmm. um, in very, very different ways. Hers, I think, is a lot more tame. Uh, whereas, again, you have the mindset similar to me in that it's a case of, OK, if, if, if something isn't, uh, you know, existing in things, what mm -hmm. can I do to make it happen? How did that kind of mindset really shape you as a person? Um... That's a good question. <laughs> That's why I asked it. <laughs> How did it shape me? Um, I, think, I don't know how it shaped me specifically. Um, I think it gave me a way to share my faith. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like a lot of my art, especially um, towards the end of um, secondary school was when I really started to have a faith that I owned for myself yeah. rather than my parents faith um and it was at that point actually my art like GCSE time my art took a big change in the content I was producing okay. um where it's very much faith-based um and I was absolutely crazy about Jesus at that mm -hmm. point like I had this real encounter um at a youth camp with God and I was just like like any opportunity I could take to <laughs> just talk about Jesus, I would. Um, so I don't know how whether my art mm -hmm. shaped me, but like there's definitely <laughs> I've shaped my art. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, and, and it's interesting that you know, again, well, it's coming to me while you're talking that a lot of people that we've interviewed in doing this show, you know, they've said similar things, especially if they're mm -hmm. you know people of faith that it's almost like that they were put on a certain path and whether or not that be art, whether or not even into the fighting world and all sorts of other things, you know, they could always see God, you know, with them and, and all these things happening. Um, talk to us a little bit, because it's not a conversation we have that often about your encounter uh, with, with Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, as, as I said, I grew up in a Christian family um, and God was just very much part of life. Um, so I've, I've always had some sort of relationship yeah. with him um, from a very early age. Again, like this is kind of the age I would be sat in a car seat in the car. Okay. Um, I can remember worshipping God, um, like singing out my little heart or <laughs> in my head. I don't I don't even know what but I remember the song. I will sing his praises and like really feeling that and yeah. like truly worshipping at that young age, um, which actually has been a real um, benefit to when I worked with children course, and like yeah. my youngest children, I was like, I know you that you can experience God for yourself because um, I've, I've been there. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, no, no, like, okay. um, so yeah, I've always, I've always worshipped and prayed. Um, I always used to pray. <laughs> That it would rain whenever we had PE because I absolutely hated outdoor PE. Um, and so a lot of the time through primary school, it rained. And I was like, that's God on my side. He's listening to my we, prayers. We should add in, in my relationship and friendship with Naomi, she's not somebody that welcomes exercise quite, you know, <laughs> and, and she'll be the first to say that, that she's like, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, you tried. I tried the bike the other day. I managed about five minutes and I was like, <laughs> Hey, that's better than four and a half. You're making progress. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, and I would like, I would worship God in assemblies as well. You know, like the little hymn books that you would have, mm -hmm. like I would, I would truly be worshiping him. Um, so yeah, like that side's always been, there. um, but then in my teenage years, late teenage years, I went away with um, our youth group and we went to the Keswick Convention okay. in the Lake District. Um, and I just had this moment um, in this massive tent that was filled with youth and they were all singing and worshipping God. Um, and in that moment, I just felt like 
with this tangible presence of God there um, that I hadn't experienced before. And I remember after the song had finished, uh, there was a lady on the stage and she was like, um, you know, God's, God's presence is, mm -hmm. is here. Um, and she described what I was experiencing. Um, and she was like, don't forget about this. Mm -hmm don't just go home, don't leave this tent, don't go away from the convention and forget, like take this with you, take this yeah. experience with you. Um, and I'd been to the Keswick convention before and then kind of gone away and carried on with my life, which wasn't yeah, yeah, a non yeah. life, but it, like it hadn't transformed me. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas at this, this particular year, I was like, you know what, she's right. Like, like this is undeniably yeah. God, I've got to, do something <laughs> like I can't just carry on and so that's when I went back home and was just completely on fire for God and um like <laughs> I was even trying to invite my teachers to the youth group I'm like I'm looking back now I'm like that's just a safeguard nightmare <laughs> you just wouldn't do that um but yeah I was I was just so on fire and that's just kind of it hasn't dwindled since um yeah so and, and i think it's, it is an amazing thing and i know you know we've interviewed other folks and, and i can't mention them on here because they, they by the time yours airs there's other people still to come so i've got to be very careful who I'll, I'll tell you about them off air um but you know again other people had said that that and one guest in particular um who was you know a guy who made a, a really big name in the in the fighting world and basically you know th this guy is you know one of the toughest guy around and he's talking to me about faith and basically mm -hmm. when he was 10 years old, you know, he'd gotten into a lot of trouble. He was in nearly in juvenile hall in uh, the United States. He was in a really bad place, but he was going to church to make fun of basically of, of these Christians. And, um, you know, his whole thing was they, they were walking around after the service, either handing out tracts or pamphlets. And uh, he went to step off the curb. Now, this is a guy, you know, even into his 20s, didn't know what a hug was. This shows you how mm -hmm. messed up he is. And he'd been stabbed and so many other things. And he went to step off this curb and um, in, in basically into oncoming traffic. And he just felt so much peace. And he couldn't explain it. And, and the whole thing is, and I've, and I've gone through, you know, things in my own life. And it's that whole thing of the, the peace that's there that you, you know, craziness can be going on around you. And literally, mm -hmm. you know, you feel this peace that's like, it literally does pass all understanding. Um, and, you know I, know, I know in my own life, you know, my journey's taking, you know, very, very different ways and very different uh, things. And that's fine. Um, you know, and it's, but it is that whole amazing thing, that whole encounter, you know, where, where some people say, you know, God or, you know, or, or whatever, you know, that they want to phrase it. But I think when you've had that and it's your own unique relationship with God, I think mm -hmm. it is life changing for, for a lot of people. And I know, again, like you say, a lot of people, you know, that they go through things in life and they're like, well, you know, I, I've now grown up, you know, I, I don't believe in God in, anymore and, and things like that. And uh, people go through different things, of course. And um, what I wanted to ask you as well, how did that then, just before we move on, affect, you know, your way of, of, of dealing with kids and, and getting involved with youth work? First of all, how did you get involved with youth, youth work? Yeah. Um... <laughs> That's the whole story in itself. So <laughs> um, I did fine arts at university. Yeah. Um, I actually chose the university, which is Aberystwyth, mm -hmm. um, because it's You specialized... realise we're going to have an American audience trying to say Aberystwyth. <laughs> That's going to be entertaining. Yeah. They're going to be looking that up. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it Aber, Aber for short. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I went there because I specialised in the traditional arts, yeah. so painting, drawing, whereas a lot of the universities I was looking at was more contemporary. Yeah. Um, unless you were going to London, which I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. So that seemed like a really good fit because I wanted to do the painting and drawing side. And then as it happens, I end up specialising in the contemporary side of art. So um I specialise in a thing called interdisciplinary studio practice. I explain what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Which basically means, um, <laughs> I don't know, anything can be art really. Mm -hmm. So I was doing like participatory projects, um, performance art. I was dressed up as a princess for a lot of my degree. <laughs> um, 
Do you, your son or daughter, struggle with direction, clarity and purpose? Maybe you struggle with anxiety. Maybe you struggle with self-esteem or confidence issues. Maybe you've got great ideas, but you've no idea how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Don't worry, you're not alone. People around the world struggle with these issues. Hi there, I'm John Morris. I'm the coach to the creative mind and I'm also a psychologist in training. For the last two decades, I've worked with people from all walks of life and all over the world, all with a wide variety of issues. I've worked with people from youth groups to adult education to people dealing with day-to-day -day living issues. And each one of them has an amazing story to tell and we've helped them get clear as to where they are and clear as to where they want to be. And I want to help you too. Like a lot of life coaches and therapists that like to drag things on and leave you dangling on the carrot, I want to make sure that each and every single time that we meet and have a life coaching session together, that you never ever leave saying, man, that was a waste of time, or I didn't get the value that I desired. I am committed to making sure that each and every single time we meet, you are one step closer by the time we finish to a goal that you have in mind. So why should you work with me? Well, let me tell you, as I said, I'm committed to making sure that I provide value, that I provide something that's step by step and easy to follow. I'm also a fantastic listener. I've been blessed with the gift of listening and I love to listen to people, their stories, their, their dreams, their desires, because there's nothing more energetic and passionate to me than when a client gets their first desire or they get that goal or they hit that big target or whatever it might be. And also, as the trifecta, I am committed to you, to helping you take action. So whether or not it be deciding on the university you want to go to, deciding on the course that you want to be in, helping you get excited and passionate about your work environment, whatever it might be, I am committed to helping that happen. I'm also committed, if you need to shed some pounds, if you need to gain some muscle mass, if you need to, I don't know, develop your self-esteem, I'm committed to helping you take action and following a step-by-step plan of action that we can put together. But now folks, I want to tell you about the early bird special offer that we are launching right now. It is for 10 people and 10 people alone. That's right, if you are interested in having life coaching sessions with me one-on-one, -on -one, 10 people have the opportunity to do that and we're looking to help these people change their lives completely. We take ages 14 and upwards, so if you're interested in learning how to get from where you are to where you want to be, to really develop that passion to live a life that you enjoy as opposed to a life that you wake up and think, ah, oh, you know, how to develop and change your mindset from maybe a negative one to a positive one, understanding what fuels your mindset and understanding what creates the kind of life that you want to live, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. As I say, this is open only for 10 people and once it's done, it's done. So click that box below, get in touch, let's have a conversation backwards and forwards and see if we're a fit for each other and I look forward to working with you. Have an amazing day folks take care god bless and i will see you soon origami was a massive part of it oh wow um so yeah i just had so much fun like it was just a lot of fun and i was using it to try and spread the message of hope mm -hmm. as well like i wasn't just having fun as a princess making origami flowers <laughs> that was just a bonus <laughs> yeah yeah i was trying to convey this message of hope mm -hmm. that i had um I forgot what you even asked me now. Where, where so it was, it was how you, you oh, yeah, transition went into youth work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, so I was doing that. Um, and then it yeah, came time to look for a job. And I was just like, no idea what kind of job I would want. Um, I've been <laughs> making paper flowers and being a princess <laughs> for the last. It, it sounds years, good when you so. say it like that, but you know, for, for an employer looking on a CV, they go like, <laughs> what <laughs> yeah um but anyway i found this job which was i think it was called a community evangelist okay and the job description was basically what i'd been doing in my degree which was doing these participatory projects with the community in okay. a way to share faith so i was like oh like perfect that is actually what i've been doing it's something i'm really passionate about i can carry on being creative carry on sharing faith um, so I applied and <laughs> didn't get anywhere with that one. Right. But it then, you know, and you do all your searches and it's like, oh, you might be interested in this and similar jobs. Yeah. Um, it then came up with children's worker jobs with churches. And so I was looking at them and I was like, well, I could do them. Like, I like children. <laughs> Why not? So I applied to 
it's qualification um, number one, although there are many teachers out there, and I know several that say, I can't stand children, I can't stand working with them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I applied to two, got interviewed with two jobs. Um, and then I had the first interview. And after the interview, they phoned me back. Actually, no, before they phoned me back, sorry. Before they phoned me back, I had a complete freak out moment um, where I was just like, what am I doing? Why, why am I applying to work for jobs with children when I don't have any qualification or very much experience in that at all? Um, just like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I asked my church for prayer. Um, this was at like an evening service that they had for the students mainly. Um, and I remember being prayed for and they asked that God would like really clearly show me whether it was my calling or not. Um, so I did these interviews and after that first interview, they phoned me back and they were like, I'm really sorry. Um, just the place that our church is in, just because of a change around in leadership, we're looking for someone with more experience for this role. But this is definitely your calling. Wow. <laughs> they were like, you know, you are you are definitely meant to be in this kind of ministry, but we're just sorry you're not the right person for us at this moment. And um, but definitely keep pursuing this type of role. So that was a real encouragement. Then I had um, a couple other people as well who um, from kind of different areas of my life, um, you know, church, um, school, wherever it was, who had said to me, children's ministry is your calling. Just kind of completely random. I wasn't like they didn't know I was freaking out about it. They didn't know I was looking for direction. And they'd said that to me. And I was like, okay, this is like three times now, I think it was that someone has specifically said this is your call. Um then had a second interview and was offered that job. Um wow. despite having no experience or anything, but um the team that were interviewing and sorting through the applications were like this is this is the right person like I just know that God's calling her to this role um and again I freaked out when I was offered the job <laughs> I was in tears um I think I phoned mom or I was messaging mom like I don't know what to do so I asked I asked them for a few days to consider the jo job um yeah. Which they let me have, you know, being gracious oh, Christians. Yes. They were like, take some time to pray over it. Um, and I actually, I accepted it on the terms that if it doesn't work out, I can always leave. <laughs> like, that was the reason why I was like, okay, let's take the step of faith, yeah. even though like God had quite clearly said it was my calling. I, I wasn't quite at that point of trust, I don't think. Uh -huh. um, and so I took it and it was just an incredible job, an incredible church. I worked with some absolutely amazing people and children and my faith mm -hmm. like just rocketed during that time. Um, and I learned so much and just like the encounters the children had with God, just, uh, they were amazing. Like, um, if I could still have that job, <laughs> I would, but this life circumstances meant that we had to move on. Um, which was really hard to do and yeah. but yeah it was incredible and so that led me on to then working for another church as a children's worker um, and then moved um, to Durham for my husband to start training to be a vicar um, and I wasn't going to look for a job um, because I was like children's ministry is the only job for me <laughs> like, that's, that's what God's called me to that's what I'm passionate about um, so I was like, if that job comes up, then um, yeah, I'll go for that. But if not, I don't need a job. So I'll probably just do something creative. And actually, it was then when I started the idea of making teddy bears uh, that was going to turn into a business, which mm -hmm. is still in the pipeline. That's still going to be part of Rudge and Garnet. Um, but God had other plans. Um, and he called me into youth ministry with the older ones. <laughs> Which again, I was just like, well, we turned up to this church um, and I was joking to them being like, if you need a children's worker, here I am. Um, and they said, well, actually, we're about to start advertising for a role. Wow. Um, so I thought, okay, so they, like exchange details, sent in my CV. And um, then they got back to me and it turns out it was actually for youth 
um so like 11 to mm -hmm. 18 years um and i'd only really worked with the naught to 11s yeah. um and the job sounded amazing but it was with the old ones and i was like i just don't know i don't know if i can yeah. do that i don't know if it's for me um so i actually i said to my husband john i was just like if this was like just to do a small group of like females mainly introverted who just want to get really stuck into the bible yeah. then i think i could do that job but the job itself was like um going out into the schools and all of that yeah. so I, I don't think i don't think that's for me um but you know i prayed about it and i asked i actually asked god to give me a dream mm -hmm. i was like will you give me a dream to tell me really clearly whether i'm meant to be applying for this or not um and actually he did give me a dream <laughs> um which was there's going to be someone actually uh for this role so don't apply because you're not there to rescue them and i was like okay so <laughs> I messaged him back and I didn't explain any of that. I think I just kept it short and was like, I don't think this is for me, but thank you anyway. Um, and then a few months later, um, they got back in touch and were like, have you got a job? <laughs> Would you like to meet up for a chat? Wow. I was like, oh, maybe they've changed the role to a children's worker. <laughs> uh, so I met up uh, with the pastor and he explained that they'd interviewed someone he was just great for the role, but great for the outreach side of the role. Right. And actually the discipleship part of the role as well. And the girls that they had, well, the group that they had was mainly girls, mainly mm. introverted, this small group who just wow. really want to go deep into the Bible. And it was just like, oh, <laughs> okay. So he's like, so we've split the job. We're, we're going to have this other guy to be, just release him to do his thing. Like he's passionate about it, he's gifted in it. We're going to release him to do the outreach. And um, would you consider coming in to do the discipleship? And I was just like, okay. That's <laughs> like, could that be any more clear from God that this is where I was meant to be? Um, so that's how I ended up doing the youth work. Um, and the group changed and developed, and uh -huh. you know, it wasn't just introverted girls, but. I absolutely loved it. Um, it's an amazing thing. And, and in some ways, hearing you describe that, you know, you, your journey seemed a lot smoother than mine. Um, and the reason that I say it is because I ended up getting involved with youth work, you know, when I was down in Huddersfield. And uh, it was literally because I was involved with bodybuilding at the time. My pastor at the time thought, oh, well, he'd be really, really good with the kids. I'd never worked with kids a day in my life. You know, I was maybe 18, <laughs> 19. And I was like, all right, OK. But then the kids start taking to you and there's energy there. There's real, mm -hmm. you know, tangible energy. Like you, I worked with the smaller ones in Huddersfield. And then I was uh, offered a gap year originally in Manchester. And then it ended up being in, in Scotland. And uh, the first church that I worked for was an Episcopal church that had zero youth. Didn't really mm -hmm. want youth being there. But again, I was doing more of the outreach stuff in, in schools and things. I didn't know this at the time, but the organization that had set it up had told the church that I was a trained youth worker. I was not a trained youth worker. I was a bodybuilder. You know, there's, there's a great difference. Um, you know, and, and oh my gosh, it, you know, it just went on and on and on. When that position ended, um, I did some manual labor for a while. And then the, the role that I got in, in Presswick, like you described, I sat in my uh, armchair that had three legs on it. It was propped up against the wall in the, the flat in Air High Street. And I was praying the exact same thing. And I was like, Lord, if this is right for me, because I was desperate at this point, I needed a job um, because money just wasn't coming in. And I was like, Lord, you know, if, if this is right for me, you know, please. And again, it was that whole thing. And I tell people all the time, I could have turned up in a monkey suit, you know, because other people, there was one guy that had interviewed for the post and he was from Uganda and everybody else had in, they'd, in, they'd interviewed was just completely wrong for the position. And then I come along and uh, literally the minister sound, said he sounds more like a bouncer as opposed to a youth worker. Again, I'm not trained. Um, and the guy who was representing me said, well, maybe that's what our youth group needs. <laughs> this guy ended up getting the job and, um, you know, it, it, it took twists and turns and everything else that was there. It wasn't as smooth ride as obviously as you know. But uh, it, it was an incredible thing, you know, when you, you start feeling that God is, is laying out these things for you and this is what you're meant to be doing and the doors open up. You're like, yeah. wow, this is incredible. 
um, you know, and it, and it really is an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, and obviously, you know, it, it's one of the things that you can sometimes look back on and say, I know that I was meant to be doing that role and how it's led on to other things as well, which is incredible. Obviously, you know, one of the things that we do want to talk about is anxiety and um, walk us through your journey of anxiety. I'll, I'll hand over to you now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, as I say, I've always been a, a worrier. Um, You've got that in common. Yeah. But anxiety itself um, really hit me. Funnily enough, around the same time, um, I really became active in my faith. Okay, that's um, interesting. Yeah, um, so it was like GCSE, A level time. Right. Um, it was possibly exam stress right. that triggered it. I don't know, but that would be my kind of guess. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, at that time, it was it was bad, like bad anxiety. I would yeah. be having uh, panic attacks, uh, anxiety attacks. Um, I'd actually have to carry around a paper bag with me um, yeah. around school in case I had a panic attack and I needed to control my breathing by breathing into this bag. Um, so some of the teachers knew. Um, so I kind of had this free pass mm -hmm. to leave a lesson right. if I needed to, uh, which was nice. Um, <laughs> like I didn't abuse it. I was I was a good, <laughs> hardworking girl. <laughs> um but not many of my um well not not really many people knew that I had it and I didn't really share it um obviously my family were aware um but perhaps not fully aware all the time I don't yeah. know um and like it kind of this intense anxiety lasted probably for around I don't know, maybe four or five years, kind of mm -hmm. went on into first uh, year or so of uni. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of manifested itself in different ways as well. Like I would go through periods where I would kind of scratch the skin down the yeah. side of my fingernails. Right. Like that would be just raw, uh -huh. um, nails bitten off um, completely. Um, it got to a point at uni actually where I would be pulling my hair out as well. Right. Um, and just like trying to listen in lectures was like yeah. it was almost impossible because it was just this constant anxiety on top of me um and like it was particularly to do with my breathing actually yeah. I think because I'd had panic attacks before okay. I was so anxious that these were going to happen in lectures which then makes you anxious which then makes you have mentally which course, then leads yeah. to panic attacks um you know it's a vicious cycle, cycle. Is. Um, so that was very difficult, obviously mingled with homesickness as well and yeah. at the start of uni. Um, and yeah, it was a it was a really, really difficult time. Um, I didn't see any professionals for any help or anything. Mm -hmm. As far as I got was the school nurse. Um, right. And also <laughs> I had a moment um, where I thought my heart had stopped. Um, okay. So <laughs> I had to go and, you know, be wired up to check that my heart was all okay. Right. It turns out, like, I just, I think I'd taken in too much oxygen. So right. my heart had to kind of miss a beat to then catch off or yeah. something. I don't know all the signs. It was just mm -hmm. the rhythm of it that had gone out of alignment. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, as I'll probably talk about um, in a bit, like health anxiety is mm -hmm. the anxiety trigger thing for me so to have <laughs> panic attacks you then panic about your health because you yeah. think what's happening to me um I remember one moment my heart was racing so 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 fast like I've never had it before thankfully you never had it again um but it felt like it was just going to come out of my chest and I remember trying to communicate to mum I think she was on the phone being oh, wow. like oh, what's happening and like obviously that was panicking me which was making yeah. it work um yeah it was a scary time um so yeah I didn't really get any professional help or anything mm -hmm. um and I think what stopped the panic attacks was actually reading that panic attacks aren't dangerous okay um 
because it, it was kind of health anxiety linked when I had that valuable piece of information I was like oh it, it okay. helps having that yes. yeah and so I think that was probably what actually stopped the panic attacks but obviously still had anxiety yeah. um and my anxiety like it's kind of then it's changed over the years I still have anxiety um but it's nowhere near as intense as that season in my life was um and it kind of it's hard to explain but I think it kind of a good way of looking at it is like it's kind of comes and goes in waves or seasons and um like often like I'm there and I don't even think about the fact I've got anxiety it's just kind of a little kind of hum in the background that you know it doesn't bother you um and then there are other things that then trigger it and it's then particularly tough to then work through that um like my anxiety and I don't (laughs) I don't know if this is coincidence um but my anxiety actually got a lot better and improved the most it has when I met John Mm -hmm. who's now my husband um I remember third year of uni like it's been so overwhelmed with joy that my nails were long oh. because I'd not been biting them. <laughs> and it was like, I used to have the most beautiful nails growing up. And then when anxiety hit, they were just destroyed. Yeah. I remember just that, like, wow, like I'm not as anxious anymore because look, my nails are amazing again. Um, so yeah, when I met John, anxiety seemed to um, calm itself down. And I say, I don't know if that's coincidence or yeah. what, but... Um, yeah like now it's it's more manageable but there are obviously still some time seasons um where it just gets difficult um and I've had like three types of therapy slash counseling um since then (laughs) um actually since getting married um I've been married five years um and each one of them have been helpful, but in a different way. Yeah. Um, the last one I had was actually CBT um, counselling, which was the best for me. Okay. Um, I guess I want to say that, like the people listening, um, don't give up if your first lot of counselling yeah. isn't right, because mm-hmm. there are lots of different counselling, like styles out there um different counselors <laughs> um, and sometimes it's about finding the right fit for you yeah. but whilst the other two were helpful in different ways actually the third one was just the best it could yeah. be um and yeah like maybe I'll can I talk a bit about that experience because yeah, that's sure. Sure. um that's the most recent um so I had this counseling towards the start of this year um like I recognized that my health anxiety needed work (laughs) um and I knew because I'd actually done some counseling training myself Mm -hmm. um so I learned a bit about different types of counseling and so from that I was like I know actually I know I need CBT for this um but from what I'd learned in my counseling um training I couldn't apply it to myself because when I was in that overwhelming anxiety position, I just, I couldn't think logically and rationally enough to bring in those skills that I'd learned were there to help people. Uh, So I was like, I need some extra help here. So I got in touch with, um, actually I get free counseling, (laughs) uh, which is amazing, um, through the Church of England, because that's where my husband's with. They actually offer um, counseling service to those training vicars and their um, spouses. So that was just a wonderful thing that I could tap into. So I got in touch with them and I didn't hear back for months. And I was just, I was at the point of giving up, to be honest. I was like, well, maybe I'm just not meant to be doing this now. Um, but I can so see God at work yeah. through that. Like it was, it was just a real blessing with how the timing all worked. Yeah. Because I ended up finally being linked up with a counsellor um, during lockdown. So my counselling sessions were virtual. Um but I, because I was addressing health anxiety, um, what actually happened was, well, this isn't 
like this isn't the reason why it happened but I got ill <laughs> I had a virus possibly coronavirus but oh, wow. who knows who knows and um, because it wasn't like the normal symptoms of coronavirus right. uh, but I had this weird thing going on in my throat and I was just very fatigued as well um and because I'd had this sore throat for so long and you know the doctor's appointments were all telephone and they didn't want to see me because they've locked down um so they like they weren't doing blood tests straight away well I say straight away you know at the point that you would do yeah. a blood test um so this had gone on for a while and because of that the doctor then decided that I needed to be screened for cancer oh wow <laughs> yeah uh, which like extremes if you tell some like a normal person that like that's going to cause some anxiety yeah. right you tell someone with health anxiety oh you're going to be screened for cancer like oh, it was crazy and the doctor was like i hope i'm not worried you <laughs> and it's like well <laughs> to be honest like, yeah. um, and he was like you know it's, it's very 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 unlikely i've never come across anyone of your age and female and your health who would have it very very unlikely but just because it's gone on for so long it's just you know something we've got to do yeah. and i was like well because i've got this irrational mind when it comes to health anxiety yeah. none of that information <laughs> was very helpful um, but I'd then been linked up with this counsellor at the same time. And so it was such a blessing because the most extreme situation with health anxiety I've ever experienced happened at the time I was receiving counselling okay. from this extremely gifted and actually I really feel like God anointed counsellor. Mm. Like her testimony of how she became a counsellor was like obviously a call from God. Um and so to be in that situation where I could work through this health anxiety yeah. with her um, during that really intense time in my life, yeah. you know, it was it was horrible, but it was such a blessing as well. Um, and like, because I was ill during the time I was trying to tackle the health yeah. anxiety, so useful as well, because I could then hear about the different tools to use with CBT and put them into practice and then if I was struggling with using them you know I could go back next week and be like yeah. okay this worked this didn't work what do I do with this um and so really coming out of that I now have like this toolkit <laughs> to use yeah. for like going forward for when I experience anxiety um and like it's not just health anxiety I've got other areas that kind of trick me as well but health is the biggest well that's what I was going to say is I think it's important for folks to know that you know when, when people say oh I've got anxiety there are so mm -hmm. many different levels of anxiety like Naomi was uh, describing health anxiety is anxiety about your health you know it's self-explanatory mm -hmm. in a lot of ways but you know when you're talking about you know all these different anxieties that people are going through it is important to notice you know the triggers and what sets you off and things like Naomi was saying you know it, you do develop tools and we were talking a little bit before we came on the show that I had actually um, worried myself sick to the point that earlier in the year um, I pretty much torn my midsection and I was out for about eight weeks um, just in chronic pain when we finally figured out all right I need to rest great I didn't know at that point because I, I hadn't linked up that stress had actually caused this until mm -hmm. recently when I was worried about well, is this, gonna, is this guest going to turn up? Is it going to be a good show? Is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? And it just went on and on and on. And there's a couple of things that I just want to pull out of that. And actually, I can pull it from my brand new book. <laughs> I'll do a segue. <laughs> I'll put up an ad in things called The Battles We All Face. And we're talking about anxiety within it. And my personal battle with anxiety has been where people are more anxious when they're thinking about the, uh, the past as what has been or what could be in the future. And, and when you're trying to stay in the, the present, that oftentimes can just really um, just kind of blow away a lot of the fears that are going on that sometimes are irrational. And it's important to ask that you know, question, is this a rational fear? I.e., could this actually happen? Or is this more irrational, like I'm gonna step out the door and aliens are gonna beam me up? And, and some people obviously would have that. 
The other thing that I want to um, throw out there about this, this topic, um, there's a couple of chapters in there called uh, Once Broken, Never the Same. And what Naomi was talking about in terms of anxiety, it's not just something that it goes away. And sometimes, you know, it, I personally believe it's because the mind has been put into such a state of stress that it, this is how it's coping. And it's saying, wait a second, wait a second, I don't know how to deal with this. What I've personally found is once somebody goes through this, and this isn't to say that you can never heal from it, but you have to have an awareness as well. And the best way I can describe it is the way that I described it to my wife the other day. And you can use this method in cooking porridge or boiling water. Bear with me. I have got a, I have got a point to this. When you boil water, um, if you boil it for long enough on a high enough heat, it's going to bubble over. Everybody knows that, okay? If you reduce the heat, it still simmers away, still bubble, 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 bubble. And if you turn back up the heat again, it's going to rise a lot quicker. And that's kind of the, the way my understanding is, and from what Naomi has described, that anxiety can really, really affect us is we can have it once bubble over and then the pressure reduces and it's still bubbling away in the background. But then once the pressure comes back on, then it starts bubbling over again. So if you're feeling that you're getting more anxious quicker, don't be, you know, kind of upset with yourself and frustrated with yourself. Why am I having this? I can't explain this. But recognize because you have this, it's sometimes going to be easier for these triggers to, to take place. And obviously the events are going to take place. And it, it requires that awareness then of, okay, how do I deal with this? We've got some new teaching coming up that will be actually uh, tagged on with this uh, interview as well. Uh, about worrying and the, the effects that stress can have. Um, and uh, that's something I want to talk to you about, Naomi. As, as, as you got older as well with anxiety, um, you know, what are some of the effects that you find now uh, as a result of anxiety? Um, oh, good question. Because <laughs> I know of myself, you know, when I'm worried, I'll give you a moment to think about it. I'll, I'll, I'll segue. <laughs> When I get really anxious, you know, it sends my brain basically into overdrive. And that could be to do with dyspraxia as well. Basically, our brains are, are wired in a way that everything goes higgledy-piggledy. Uh, imagine a car that when you turned on the ignition, the windscreen wipers worked. Or when you opened the door, you know, the, the, the bonnet opened or, or whatever. Um, that's kind of a dyspraxic mind. But then you've also got anxiety on top of that. And it's trying to figure out how to co cope with that. When mine's really severe... I get the heart palpitations like Naomi was saying, I get massive headaches, my brain is spinning in overdrive. And when it's really bad, my body, my bones and my insides literally feel like they're corroding. And that's not an exaggeration. That's the best way that I can put it. Um, and it's, it's finding these tools where it's not fun to go through those valley periods in time and those difficult periods of time. But if you can learn something from it, it's, it's, you know, it's worth it. Naomi, go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... I think, so for me, when there's something that particularly triggers me, um, it's really hard for me to think about anything else. Yeah. It's just this consuming um, thought. And I, so I have a, an amazing imagination, yes. which is <laughs> great for some things, but absolutely awful yeah. for um, <laughs> some anxiety. I catastrophize amazingly, <laughs> which me and my uh, counselor had a good laugh about. Uh, but like in one second, I can, my brain could literally be like worst case scenario, very vivid, very real in my mm -hmm. mind, which is not helpful. Um, so one of the tools actually that I, I was taught was when you start getting this yeah. um, worry, this anxiety, when you like a lot of it is about being aware of yourself yeah. and your body and you can recognize the signs. And if you catch it at the start yeah. and ask yourself, um, what am I afraid of? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the key question. What am I afraid of? Then you can challenge those thoughts before yeah. you start spiraling into the catastrophizing um, nightmare. It's a great word. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, for me, if I haven't caught it early, yeah. I will viral catastrophize and it will just be an all-consuming worry mm -hmm. on my mind which is then it's then hard to kind of go about your normal life yeah. as it were um I think when when things are normal as in not lockdown situation yeah. you have normal distractions mm -hmm. so you get on with just general life and that's helpful but I think I find it particularly hard during lockdown because 
like it's just me yeah. <laughs> not yeah. in the house um, I'm not seeing other people I'm just I'm alone for a lot of the time right. so if it's hit during that time I think it's been particularly more difficult to deal with because I don't have the distractions there. Um, but yeah, it can be consuming when it's particularly bad. Um, I think that's, that is a good way of putting it. And, and one of the things that actually came out of my latest battle with anxiety and worry was what we call the traffic light system. Um, but it sounds like a really cool dance that you, I'm sure you'll get a kick out of. Green light, yellow light, red light, meltdown. And, you know, Katie was laughing at this and she's like, yeah, it sounds like an 80s groovy dance that you were doing, you know, the discotheques and things. Um, but basically, it is exactly as Naomi was saying, having an awareness of, you know, what kind of stage you're at. So green light, obviously, is feeling good, happy, everything's good. When it starts getting into amber stage, there's stress going on, there's, you know, maybe slight pain that's going on, discomfort, little bit of frustration when you're heading into the red stage, if you're me. Uh, it's, you know, quite severe pain, really frustrated, starting to get angry, small things are really going to tick you off. And when it's, and, and, you know, you're getting more negative as well. When you get into meltdown stage, that's where you've got severe pain, you're really angry all the time, you're cursing, you know, the air blue, and there's just, you know, it, it's not fun for anybody to be around you. And it's really important to have an awareness, folks, of, you know, of, of where you're at and do those daily checks and say, hmm, how am I feeling today? And it's okay to ask those questions. Um, and, and obviously going forward. Um, Naomi, obviously, you know, you, your journey then takes a, a, an amazing step because like you said, you started your uh, brand new business as well. Talk to us a little bit about that. Hmm. Yeah, so um, like I've always wanted to have my own little business. Of like course. it's always been a little dream in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of always been a one day, <laughs> like one day this will happen. Um, but like we ended up moving here where we are now in the West Midlands um, for um, John's training um, and as a result I found myself without a job again um, and actually I was like well maybe now's the time to start this business um, which will hopefully sell teddy bears and um, that's the plan to start their safety testing next year but currently sells um, cards, gift wrap, uh prints uh candles they got some candles in hey, there. very good yeah but yeah general gift wear um and i really want to i guess it's a continuation of my degree really like yeah. i want to carry on sh uh, sharing hope and joy through the work that i produce um not just like the messages on the prints and stuff which are nice encouraging messages um and nice happy cheerful patterns and stuff um but actually the reason i launched my business so soon um instead of keeping on putting it off um saying one day was actually because um it was another god story really where i'd felt really convicted i guess is a word to to go out and help people and to truly love people and serve people. Um, and the, part of me was also like, I've been given these gifts of creativity and art um, and I want to use them, yeah. but I don't know how, and I don't know how to go and love people. And um, by loving people, like, as in like <laughs> serving them and, you know, yeah. helping those uh, less fortunate than yourself. Um, so like, I got those kind of two things in around my mind, how um, I was praying about them. And the things that kept coming back to me were art workshops, kind of just kept coming back in my mind. But again, I was like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what that would look like. Um, and randomly, um, human trafficking came to yeah. my yeah, mind yeah. a lot when I was praying, which, you know, has not been anything that's ever been on my radar at all. So I was like, Mm, this is random I should explore this <laughs> uh, maybe God's leading me in a, a new direction so I spent some time kind of just googling <laughs> human trafficking support website type things uh, I, was like, yeah, I was like maybe there's a job out there or a volunteer <laughs> opportunity uh -huh. out there for me so I was like going through all of these different charities uh, and just none of the jobs really fit me or would have been practical uh, and then I stumbled across uh, Black Country Women's Aid uh -huh. website 
And on it, they were doing a fundraising campaign where you knit or you sew hearts. And then you sell them on um, and it raises money to go towards the survivors mm. of um, domestic abuse and human trafficking. They support human trafficking victims um, or survivors. Um, and I was like, oh, like this is something I can do. Like this is art and it's actually helping people. Whilst I may not be the person physically there helping mm. them at this moment, like this is a start. At least I can do this. Absolutely. So I got in touch with them um, and the lady I was emailing, I, was, I mean, it might have been a really random email where I was just like, I just feel led to help people. <laughs> like, um, so I and I you, had, who is this nutter? Yeah, I have art gifts and I can you give me any more information. <laughs> and she got back and she was like, well, what do you want to do? Like, you want to do art workshops? And I was just like, wow. What? Like, no way. So obviously that can't happen at the moment with yeah. lockdown situation. But in the future, that's on the cards that I might actually be able to go and help some of these women who have been involved in trafficking and do art workshops for them, which wow. would really help like their mental health. And um, yeah, so that's really exciting. Absolutely. Um, and then obviously I got involved with the Heart Project for them. Um, but I wanted to do something more. Yeah. Um because I was like, while I can't physically be there and I can't be literally helping the people yeah. in person at the moment, I still want to do something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to give 10% of my sales from my business to that charity, um, which I have been doing, um, which is exciting. And I'm just so glad, like, through the art that I create, actually, yeah. it's going towards a really good cause as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the little story behind Rich and, and Garnet. And it is, and it's, it's an amazing thing, you know, because as we found, you know, with this, um, you never know where your gifts are going to lead. I never knew when mm. I started out 18 years ago that I would be now doing, obviously, this podcast with, you know, celebrities and folks from all over the world. I, I just never even envisioned this. And this is like mm. our second month that we're doing this. It's, it's weird. And, and there's times that you're like, uh, God, because I have, I was going to circle back to this, but I had the, a similar prayer to yours. It wasn't for a dream, but it was whenever I was doing something major um, that could be life or death. I was like, Lord, if this is not right for me, do whatever it takes to stop me. Just don't kill me. Um, and, you know, that's a good prayer to pray. I prayed it when I went to the United States. I prayed it when I moved to Scotland. Um, but, you know, it, it is amazing, you know, how, you know, God has been so much a part of your life. And folks, I, I want to share a story as well, because I think it's it, it will help, you know, um, kind of bridge the gap on how Naomi and I actually met. I was running uh, the, the School of Art in Troon, where Katie and I lived, and uh, we were doing adult classes and everything, and we, we just put the feelers out there to see if folks wanted to do an adult class, and uh, Pam, who's Naomi's mom, actually got in touch with me. Uh, they hadn't long moved to, to Scotland, and I think it was a case of, well, well I'm looking to do something to, uh, you know, to get out and to meet people and whatever else. Now, I've got to say, at this point, I was really negative on the church. In fact, scratch that. I was really negative full stop. I was having medical reactions. I was just in a horrific way. Let's put it like that. And if my wife was here, she'd, she'd be like, yeah, he, he, you know, just, just terrible. But the amazing thing was like, like what Naomi's described, you know, in terms of God putting her in the right place. And I firmly believe that God puts people in our path for a reason uh, and, and at the right time as well. Pam came over to the, the art class and normally, you know, that there'd be six or seven uh, in the art class. Sometimes, you know, it was weird that folks would mysteriously get ill all of a sudden and then all of a sudden wouldn't turn up. And I've never shared this with you, Naomi, actually, I don't think. And it, the, the only person that would actually turn up would be your mom. And there's times <laughs> that we would sit there and I'm like, OK, normally I'd be freaking out about this. We've only got one student in, but I was more at peace about it. And I was just like, mm, OK. And then the conversations that started to come out you know, weren't threatening, weren't uncomfortable, weren't come to our church, you know, because it's really, really, really amazing for you. It was, you know, just an opportunity to express, you know, and, and talk about the things that we've both gone through and things that would both happen and have someone actually understand because for so much of my journey, it was always what, what I call the party line stuff where, well, you need to pray about it. You need to do this. You need to do that. And there was very little understanding. And obviously as we're going to talk about momentarily. I know you've gone through that as well. It's, it's amazing how this circles back actually. That, that was really <laughs> yeah. a nice segue. Um, but you know, and, and through Pam, obviously I met your dad, Dave, and, and formed an amazing relationship and friendship with them for both Katie and I. 
and then obviously got to meet you and, and your two other sisters, husbands and, and kids and dogs and cats and everything, and everything else that's there. And it was just an amazing thing because, you know, now Naomi's obviously working in business. It's nice to be in a, a very uh, loosely, you know, in, in terms of being able to give advice and things. And obviously, because I've been in it for so long. And it's just wonderful how all that has come about, you know, as a result from one lady taking a step and saying, hey, I'm new to the area, but could I be part of the art class? And I believe actually, I, I don't know if it was yourself or, or whoever it was, it was one of the, the sisters um, that was up there was like, mom, we are not allowing you on social media again, because you just basically asked to come to an art class with a strange man who you've never met before in an area you, you don't know about. I remember her messaging, she was like, I don't know what I've done. <laughs> I've just messaged this random guy. <laughs> The funny story behind this is it would usually be ladies that would come when we were running at our home because we were running smaller art classes at that point. The funny story was the first night that we launched, we had four ladies all come in and all at the same time when they realized I was not a serial killer, they all took out the phones and messaged their husband saying, we're completely safe, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> because in order to get to the, the the flat and the apartment they had to go through this dark um corridor basically uh that was very dimly lit and everything and it looked like something that would lead into prison um and and yeah that was hilarious in itself but it was amazing how it worked out but Naomi I wanted to ask you because I know we, we talked about this and I think this is a really important part of the show um because a lot of folks, when you're going through these anxiety battles, a lot of folks, when you're going through any battle, quite honestly, and it tends to be, unfortunately, people of faith that will come out and say, well, I know you're struggling with anxiety. Here's a scripture for you. I know you're struggling with depression. Pray, you know, pray the Lord. And, you know, for me, that really turned me off to a lot of a lot of things going on, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a lot of it was just dismissive. And because I was so angry with how the church had been at that point, and, and I got to tell you, folks, when I you know, when I'm in that meltdown stage, I am not fun to be around. I do not do interviews when I'm in that meltdown mm -hmm. stage because it isn't good. Um, but it, at least it's honest. Um, but you know, I found it really difficult to process these things because in my mind, I'm like, well, you know, believers, uh, which is what I label myself as now, uh, or Christians or people of faith, whatever you call them, you know, in, in my mind, you know they're not always going to get things right first and foremost and the more aware of their uh, struggles and, and, and battles and things but some of them you know just were downright horrible human beings quite honestly uh in, in, in the nicest way possible um and obviously you went through that as well with your anxiety battles talk to us a little bit about that and some of the folks that were around you at that time that was possibly giving you that kind of you know response of well here's a scripture yeah um yeah this be, it's been something i have i i don't know if struggled with is the right word more grappled with maybe okay. like it's been something that i've i've been trying to explore and dig into um so i've had experiences where when i've shared because i'm quite like i have been quite private about yeah. sharing about my anxiety um and actually, I think I've become less private the older I've got, probably mm -hmm. more because I have my anxiety a bit more under control. So, I, like, about. yeah, it is like when you're going through it really badly, then I yeah. think it's really difficult to actually open up about that. Um, but yeah, when I have shared it, um, like because I generally move in a lot of Christian circles, yeah. <laughs> it's generally Christians that I'm speaking to about it. Yeah. And there have been responses where it's just like, well, you just need the faith or yeah. you just trusted in God um, or the, the verse, which <laughs> I actually really went and explored this one because like just something makes sense to me um, is perfect love casts out fear. Yeah. Like that one was a big one that would be thrown my way or even like, it's not even just necessarily people in person but it's mm. on instagram yeah. you know social media like the little pretty pictures <laughs> are there to encourage and they're there yeah. for like from the best intentions i generally believe um but actually i think they can be really damaging and i think yeah. they can they can make you feel like you're being a bad christian or you haven't got enough faith or you just don't trust god or you're not you're not letting God love you enough, or you don't love God enough, and all of that. So yeah. the the perfect love that casts out fear verse, like this is one of the ones which I really struggled with. 
because I was like, well, I'm, I'm still experiencing fear in some areas of my life. So what does that mean? A perfect love casts out fear and I'm still fearful. Does that mean I've not received God's perfect love? Is that my fault? Or does God just not love me enough? Or, you know, it was all of those questions. So I was like, right, let's read this verse in the Bible. Let's see what it actually says. And when I was reading it, I was like, oh, okay, this this is interesting because it was actually um, talking about um, like judgment yeah. and um, eternal life and salvation. And it was saying, well, if you are a Christian, if you have a relationship with Jesus and, you know, you know what he's done for you on the cross, then you don't need to fear judgment because yeah. you're you've got eternal life yeah. like you've no need to fear that um because you've received this perfect love this sacrificial love you, you don't need to fear and I was just like wow yeah. <laughs> now that makes sense like that that makes so much sense rather than just well because I'm fearful about yeah. health anxiety God doesn't love me enough kind of thinking but, but that's part um, of the, I was just, just going to touch, you know, f first thing that came out of that was so many will take, you know, things out of context and just throw it at you. Mm -hmm. What I always yeah. got was all things work together for good. And I'm like, yeah. that doesn't help me right now. And like I said, I became um, short of uh, being like St. Paul before he became a believer. You know, I was the next <laughs> step below because I was really, really angry with a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it, and it was one of those things where, you know, it was actually through my best friend, which actually shares the same name as me. Um, you know, he and I formed this bond because he had gone through so many things. He's, he's now in his 70s. And, you know, he became my mentor. And it was incredible because he had gone through very similar experiences where people were just telling scripture after scripture or, you know, they, they give the party line or the... And, and, I think, folks, what, what we're trying to say is the best thing you can do is not, in, in my opinion, rattle out scriptures or fire off these encouraging messages or anything like that. And sometimes they can be helpful. But I think the best thing that can be helpful is I maybe don't understand this. I don't know what you're going through, but I'm here because mm -hmm. that tells me that you're actually interested in me. You actually bother about me as opposed to being, you know, one of these lunatics that all they can do is, is quote scripture. Yeah. And I think that's oftentimes where the church really fails. They do a lot of things great, but that's one of the things that they really, really, um, I think struggle with a lot. Sorry, Naomi, I, I, I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> no. right. Yeah. Like I think, I think sometimes like scripture, like giving scripture can be really, really helpful. I yes. know. Like I kind of put out that question a while ago because I was actually thinking of doing something, whether it was a podcast yeah. or a video or something to talk about this. Um, so actually, it was really nice that you invited me to do this because like, oh, I've got this opportunity <laughs> to actually have this conversation with someone. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I know some people have found that really helpful, um, and I think I think the important thing is to get to know the person, right. get to know yeah. what they're dealing with and get to know like, what is, what are they struggling? What's their anxiety? Yeah. Why are they going through it? And then really pray and, and do <laughs> like, take care with what you share with yeah. them um, rather than just grabbing all the verses of anxiety yeah. that you can. Um, actually, you know, go away and, and do a bit of research <laughs> um, because like if someone had told me, um, you know, the perfect look has that fit, that wasn't helpful. But if yeah. someone has said, actually, you know, God's mercies are new every morning mm -hmm. and you're going through this rough time, but each day is going to give you enough strength that you yeah. need. Like that would have been yeah. so encouraging. And that Bible verse would have been like just wonderful. <laughs> I mean um, but I was, yeah. I was just going to say as well, knowing you the way I do, obviously, I think the world of you, but, you know, more so than that, if someone's turning around and giving you these doubts and these fears when already going through difficulties mm -hmm. and struggles and say, and you're ending up feeling like, well, does God love me enough? Do I have a heart for God? If you don't have a heart for God, we're all stuffed. Let's put it like that, because <laughs> you just resonate, you know, that heart of, you know, for God and that love of God. Um, and one of the things, you know, that it, it, it just came up when, when I was um, listening to you. You know, how did you keep that mm, what's the, hmm, happiness, love, passion, kindness, gentleness, everything that's there when you were going through these times? And, you know, in, in my case, I was more like, 
right okay come on world let let's go you know my, my fists were up whereas you, you just seemed more you know just loving i think is the best way of putting it how, how did you retain that um <laughs> honestly i have no idea <laughs> and sometimes it can be the person's nature i mean it's literally i could yeah. just be a grouch after all this time of um you know, feeding that monster whereas and that's why it comes back to what you're feeding sorry go on hear me yeah no it's interesting that actually the period when i looked when i've looked back over my life the periods where my anxiety is perhaps been the most challenging have been the times i've grown the most in my faith yeah. um which just fascinates me <laughs> um so and I think that's why I've really struggled when people have been like well your faith clearly isn't good yeah. enough because I'm like well no my faith like never that's been something you hold really you know precious yeah, yeah. to yeah yeah I was like my faith has never been as strong as it is at yeah. this moment and then you know it keeps growing and developing and it's through those difficult seasons actually it's really flourished mm -hmm. um I don't know, like, my thoughts around this are, and this is just my thoughts, and I might change yeah, yeah. in weeks or months <laughs> or years to come. So this is We're always like, changing, it's okay. Solid truth. This, is, this is my theory, anyway. <laughs> Wise words for me. Um, according to Naomi. <laughs> yeah, so this is what I think. Um, I think there are, in the broadest sense, two forms of anxiety okay <laughs> very broad one is anxiety where actually you aren't trusting in god um and so that's causing anxiety um and so as a result yes maybe you do need to repent because i've had that as well like people tell me i need to repent for my anxiety um which like to be fair in some instances yes that's been very true yeah. because you know i like god's clearly told me something yeah. <laughs> I'm still freaking out about it. It's just and one I'm of the like, people come up to you, and again, this is the reason that I was laughing about it, and, and it puts my heckles up because I'm just like, you need to repent, you need to repent, and it's like, who the heck are you to tell me what I need to do? Yeah, yeah. So, I know we're in different lines these days, but go on. Yeah. Like, there's, so there's that side where yeah. I think, you know, like there is, there is a sense of you need to trust in God yeah. and like pray pray through it all and turn to the scripture to help mm -hmm. like during that time when I was having this cancer scenario going yeah. on um like I found so much peace in the Psalms like yes. I like, stood yeah. in the Psalms and like that just unexplainable peace mm -hmm. was just there and that was beautiful um so I think that there are situations that perhaps you know you do need to <laughs> take a look at where are you and, and where's your faith yeah. at and is this something that actually um could easily just be given to god and dealt with um so i think actually <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this this is quite random i think you'll like it <laughs> with things like that i have i use my imagination for good oh no <laughs> and i have <laughs> god's post box <laughs> okay so, i'm intrigued for example, if I was stressing about a maths exam, like this is something where I could, you know, I can pray about that, give that yeah. to God. And if I'm freaking out and having mass anxiety about it, for me personally, this isn't for anyone else in that situation. Yeah. For me personally, that is not like that is my lack of trust in God and all of that side of things. But like it's very individual for everyone so i don't want to just label that as saying if you're stressing about a math exam you <laughs> you need to repent like that's not what i'm saying but for me that was an area where it's just like no you need to just, like trust god with it yeah <laughs> so if I had that in my imagination i would imagine an envelope and i would decorate it mm -hmm. to look like a maths exam envelope okay. so like it might be an envelope made of graph paper and have equations written on it um and that's part of the fun process is decorating my envelope and it's a distraction as well and yeah then i put like in my mind i'd imagine me putting the worry of the maths exam in yeah. that envelope i'd seal it up and then I post it in this letterbox I can see in my mind's eye that has Jesus stood next to it. And uh, that's me being like, I'm giving this to you, God. Yeah. Like, once it's through that letterbox, it's not my worry. Like, that's that's yours. 
Um, and then if that worry will come back to me, I'll just get the envelope, reseal it, stick it back in. Um, so anyway, <laughs> it's a slight side tangent, but I think there's, there's one part of anxiety that's a bit like that, where, you know, it, it is a case of yeah. trusting God. But there's an other side to anxiety where it's more complicated than that. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray through it and you shouldn't trust God with it um, because you should. <laughs> and I'm not saying that God can't instantly miraculously heal you because he can. Yeah. And like that's happened in people I know. Um, but and this is what I learned actually from my last lot of counseling, that um, if you've had like trauma or you've been abused, you know, you've got um, emotional yeah. abuse or um, whatever it is, if there's something that's happened um, or neglect, if there's something that's happened, then uh, I'm not any expert in the science behind this, so I apologise to any <laughs> counsellors or psycho whoever out there. Um, we should finish that one as opposed to psychos, psychoanalysis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like psychologists. Any psychos psychoanalysis. out there? Yeah, any psychos. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so how I understand it um, is if you've experienced that, then your brain then thinks in a different way or yes. functions in a different way. And so to tell someone just trust in God, yeah. well, that's not helpful. Yeah. It's like saying to someone with a broken leg, just trust in God and your yeah. leg will be fine mm -hmm. well actually no you need to deal with that leg and you need to get the right medical help for that mm -hmm. leg and I think that's the same with this anxiety yeah. you need to deal with that anxiety by getting the right medical help for that anxiety um you know like with hormones as well like that's one thing that can cause anxiety oh yeah yeah um you know you, need, you may need the medication for that it's not just as easy as well yeah. it just, just gotta be fine um actually my so for me personally um my counselor explained it in a way that was really helpful where she said that she had missed a science lesson at school um because she was ill she'd missed that lesson and then when she came back to the school she struggled with science from then on wow and the reason was because she'd missed that one key lesson that had taught the rest of the class is really important bit of information. Oh, wow. But because she didn't have that information, she then just struggled and the teacher thought she was rubbish at science. And you know, no one could explain it. They just thought she was awful at science. The truth is she just hadn't learned something. And she was explaining that that's like my brain, mm -hmm. that my thinking side and my emotion, my feeling side, haven't learned how to work together for whatever reason in my past that's just not happened yeah. and this is normally a process that happens in childhood and you just grow up and you learn it like a natural yeah. thing but whatever for whatever reason that's not happened for me which then means that I then struggle when it comes to some anxiety because mm -hmm. I haven't learned how to process emotion properly okay. um so like I am in the process of teaching myself how to rethink and <laughs> teaching my mind what it should have learned as a child, which is a really difficult process yeah. because it's like reteaching my brain how it's yeah. thought for 30, like nearly 30 years mm -hmm. to think in a different way. Um, so like if someone wants to say to me, like, here's a Bible verse, trust in Jesus. Yeah. It's like, well, actually, like, it's a bit more than that yeah. yes I do trust in Jesus and like I'm praying through this and he's walking me through this like as you've seen with yeah, what yeah. I explained earlier like linking me up with that cancer at the time um but it's just like there's I feel like there's more to it yeah yeah um it's not just a quick simple just trust like yeah just take this bible verse with you because you've got the spiritual side but you've also got the realities and the physical side as well mm -hmm. you know that's you know and th those are they're always the two things that we're we're trying to mirror up just before we move on from anxiety and and if you know again if, if you know if this is something that you want to touch on um looking back for you what was some of the greatest battles that you had um through your life well certainly growing up and obviously to where you are now um I mean, I, I think really what I've shared is like my greatest 
back to most recently has been reteaching my brain how to yeah. think. Like <laughs> it's hard work, it really is. Um, and I guess like growing up um, and having anxiety, it is like being a Christian with anxiety yeah. um, because there's, there's expectations out there that you should be full of peace and you should have it all together. And um, yeah, and I just, I think that's been tricky mm. because it's it's almost like, well, who do I share this with? Yeah. Who I know is going to understand? Um, and there are some people where I've needed to share it with, like bosses, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, where it's like actually you need to know this about me (laughs) um and it's kind of there's a worry there about well how are they going to react um so yeah I'd say that's they've kind of been the struggles really Um, um going forward in your life what are you excited about um I am excited about my little business (laughs) it's amazing to see how it's growing already it's fantastic yeah um yeah so I'm really excited about the opportunity to actually make teddy bears <laughs> I think that's incredible I really do it's, it's awesome yeah like I'm gonna have to burn them which is a horrible a horrible thought well don't do the thing where you throw their voice and don't give them voices <laughs> no. oh I know it's gonna be hard you know what my imagination's like um so yeah definitely that side of things just looking how my business is going to grow and develop um but also this art workshop side of things like that's really exciting um kind of nerve-wracking as well like I've done art workshops with my job um with the young people but it's a bit different when you're going out to someone else um to do it so yeah but that's exciting so it is. It's really, really fantastic. Naomi, is there anything before we wrap up today that we haven't touched on that you want to, to share with us? Um, I think maybe just to re-emphasize that point about if you are a Christian mm-hmm. and you have or you know someone who is a Christian and struggles with anxiety. Um, like, <laughs> be there, be there for them and yeah. um, pray for them. Um, and like I said, like do your research. Don't just have this handful of what may be helpful for some people, yeah. Bible verses, um, to throw at them, but actually take time to be like, what would be the most helpful for this person in this season? And that may change over the time. Um yeah, just kind of be there encouraging and praying for them. And I think that's a fantastic thing. And I think if I can remind anybody of anything, it would be, you know, don't judge someone based on, you know, your experience at that point in their mm-hmm. journey, because we're all changing, like Naomi said, you know, and also bear in mind that people are doing the best with what they've got, you know, in the circumstances they're presented yeah. with. Um, and, you know, we want to put that out there for everybody. And again, if you are struggling, you know, make sure that you do reach out. We are developing something, as I've said uh, a couple of times now on the show called the listening ear to let you guys know that there is always someone that's there. There are going to be people there and we're developing that as we speak. Obviously check out, you know, um, our brand new book, The Battles We All Face. Naomi, where can folks reach you on social media? Um, they can find me if they search Rudge and Garnet, which is R-U-D-G-E and G-A-R-N-E-T-T. Uh, so I'm on Instagram and I'm also on Facebook as well. And I have an Etsy shop. Um, so if you search for Rudge and Garnet on Etsy, you should find me there as well. And we'll put up all the links underneath, obviously on YouTube and on Facebook as well. So you can check out Naomi's uh, artwork, you check out her bears. And obviously it's such an exciting you know, journey to be part of with you and to see how you're growing, how your business is growing. It's delightful. Is there anything you want to say just before we wrap up for today? Um, I, I think we're good. Unless you want to hear a really cool story about how God has spoke to me through anxiety. Go for it. Okay, I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a really awesome story that I, I think might encourage some of you. So um, I hate flying. Like that's one of my fears is flying. Um, but I was, I was in America who no last year it was last year uh, to become a godparent which was exciting so obviously you have to fly there and back um and on the the day I was flying back I was praying about the journey because obviously I don't like flying so I was just giving that to God and he said to me um 
there's going to be something wrong with your flight but don't worry it's going to be fine and you're going to get home safely like it's not really going to affect anything <laughs> okay <laughs> so turn up to the airport check in and everything and then look at the board our flight's been delayed right and i was like oh okay this is what god was telling me about because actually it it didn't affect anything it just meant we had a bit of a long wait yeah. at that airport and a short one at the changeover um i was like fine go tell me about this it's all gonna be okay so i'm gonna get home safely so actually like i was feeling peaceful yeah. even though i hate flying there was the peace there from god then <laughs> praying again still praying and god was like you're gonna experience horrible terrible turbulence oh, no. on this next flight uh, but don't worry it's <laughs> going to be fine and you're gonna get home safe um and i'm sure he said like it would be just at the start of the journey and the rest of the journey would be fine as well right. and i was like okay <laughs> so sure enough on that flight horrible turbulence like i've never experienced it before um i i can't say that i kept wonderful perfect peace yeah. through it um but weirdly there was a peace despite the absolutely terrifying squeezing john's hand off <laughs> like, um like the the music that i was listening to at the time was actually a song that god had given me before the flight and it just spoke so much peace even though i was also experiencing so much yeah. anxiety it was really weird to understand or even explain but that was happening and i was like it's gonna be okay i trust you i trust you i trust you <laughs> this is horrible though it's really horrible um, but sure enough it all happened as he said then they're still praying and he was like um, the worst part of your journey is actually going to be the car ride home. But oh, don't no. worry, you're going to get home safe. <laughs> so, but at this point, I was like, look, you've spoken to me before. Yeah. And it's already, and he's spoken to me. Um, that It might have been the day before, but it was definitely that week. Something similar to do with a car journey. Okay. Um, so I was like, this is definitely God's voice. I know I know who I'm hearing. I know he's, what he's spoken three times now has come true in just this short period of time. So I'm going to trust him with this last one as well about the uh, car journey. And sure enough, like, it was horrendous. We ended up with a flat tire in the taxi. Oh, ended wow. up on the side of a road. Um, <laughs> stranded in this taxi. Then got picked up by another taxi. I think we'd also lost our luggage at this point. Oh, I no. might have seen that. Um, got picked up by another taxi. And I'm sure he had a death wish, this driver. Like, I've never been in a crazier driving driven car than that one. Um, but because God had spoken to me, I was like, I'm actually okay about this because I'm going to get home safe. <laughs> yeah um which was just like that was incredible for me to be able to look at that and be like wow i've trusted god yeah. and i have felt that peace um so yeah and i did i get, got home safe all was fine <laughs> but i just thought you know that's a little story that actually you know trusting god yeah. does bring peace um it's just not always the most helpful thing to say if the, the root of the anxiety stems Correct. from trauma abuse neglect and hormones and all of that stuff so. And I think, you know, that is, you know, it is important, like we said, just before we wrap up to, to really explore at the root of everything that's going on, find out where, you know, your anxiety or your struggles coming from, because at least then you're going to have a better chance of actually dealing with it. And it's, it's been yeah. a blast, Naomi, getting to do this with you. We've got to do this again at some point, because I think there's always yeah. more to unpack, as I say, with every guest that's here. <laughs> and folks, if you've enjoyed this show, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Tell a friend because it may be the very thing that helps them. And if you subscribe, it also helps us. Check out Naomi's work uh, and we'll put up all the links for you and you can come and visit us at thebattleswillface.com. If you've got any questions for us, do feel free to get in touch and we're here to help. And until next time, she has been the amazing Naomi Evans. I have been your host, John Morris. This has been the Mind, Body and Soul podcast, helping you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life through inspirational, motivational and educational content. Until next time, we're out of time. Take care.